dangerous way, and the house would empower people, and we don't want to see that power, and then basically destroy the control and the influence that you can have in a positive way. But first, I want to look at what's happened in the debate so far, and I want to look at sort of, uh, firstly, the idea about sort of what the point of preaching about rights is and credibility on that issue, then look at actually what that actually means and how it works, and how South Propositions misunderstood that. And lastly, look at how organic change can really happen, um, and, and how that's undermined before going on to uh, the other two main stuff. So, first off, credibility on rights. Now, they seem to think you need like a strong you, uh, universal policy on rights in order to be able to have a position on that. We just don't think this is like the truth, right? We think it would be possible to promote a view in other countries um, without, so, so for, for example, this debate is not about promoting views, but about forcing views on other countries. Like, that's a different thing. We think you can promote your views on, like, what's the right thing to do in Africa as the EU very easily without forcing it. No, thank you. We also think that, like, bigoted people who hold, like, like views that we disagree with aren't going to be looking at, like, what the EU is saying and saying, oh, yeah, well, in Slovenia, they agree with me. Therefore, I'm not going to buy into like, this program. That's like you just want the kind of thing that happens. And at the end of the day, the way you get credibility is for real change and people feeling comfortable living in those countries. Real change, that's not going to happen. Let's talk about why it's not going to happen and the kind of backlash that Dan already talked to you about length and we feel like he's insufficiently engaging with, right? Because we just don't think opposition gets what this backlash point is about, right? The first speaker says, oh yeah, but well, the backlash isn't that, like, that big a deal because it's not a big harm if like some people get angry because they're religious, right? The problem is not that they're getting angry and are upset, right? The problem is what they do when they are upset and angry. And the kind of stories they tell to each other, the kind of narratives they build up, and then the way they treat the other people around them and crush them and, and make it impossible for them to live happy and fulfilled lives, right? What kind of things happen, right? Reprisals genuinely happen, no thank you. Dan talks to you at length about how enforcement of these kinds of laws is incredibly difficult. No response given to that, right? At the grand level, no thank you, sir, these kind of changes need to happen in a very personal sense. Because the kind of thing you're, uh, um, you're, you're dealing with is what Dan brings up in point of information. And the response to this, again, just misses the point, right? She says, oh, well, I don't see how uh, it could be uh, possible that protecting Roma rights would cause your state not to look after you as much. Right? Obviously that's not actually happening, but it makes it incredibly easy for these people to tell a story that, they can, that the Western countries in the EU who think they know everything right are telling you like how to run your lives and how to run your country. That they don't care about you, but they care about a minority group that you think are a bane upon your society, right? And they're disagreeing not only with your deeply held views, but possibly your God and your priest and your entire, uh, like, Community, right? That is a very dangerous thing, though, thank you. It's something very difficult to deal with. Um, and it, it's just it's like genuinely causing suffering uh, to people. Like, you know, you can say, oh, it, it's not a big deal, it's bad, but it's hard to tell yeah. that to the family of, of like a gay man who gets lynched um, at the end of the day. Okay. How can organic change actually happen? No, thank you. Um, because they told us, like, for example, the Rome are like too small to affect change themselves. And we think that is like a big problem, right? But we don't think it's going to get any better because of all the reasons we've just said. But the way we can get that kind of change is through not state down interaction, but personal interactions that allow people to experience um, new ways of looking at things. So how does that happen? We think the first of all, through uh, in the, the democratization process that we think is occurring um, in each two of countries as a result of member states, but a slow process happens internally. We think, crucially, a process of interaction with people with different viewpoints happens when you have totally free movement between these countries and trust between them, right? And when you undermine the trust and faith with uh, the European Union and the other countries within it, your neighbor states who might have more progressive views, and you lessen that dialogue, it actually really undermines the ability for that kind of organic change to happen. Yeah, go ahead. So your position was that these spaces of homophobic are worse than the legal states of minorities. Historically, that doesn't work. EU states are states of law. They will enforce this if grudgingly, and therefore improve the life quality for people A now. So okay, all right, all right, all right, all right. Okay, um, you, you guys unfortunately missed your chance to like, actually engage with Dan's extensive analysis as to why the enforcement doesn't work because people aren't buying into it. But also because, like, a lot of this kind of stuff doesn't happen within the umbrella of the law, right? It happens in your day to day interactions with people and, like, your one on one in your doctor's room or um, in your jail cells, like, it's just not something that you can force people to do if they're not going to. And if you look at like, somewhere like South Africa, which has this kind of policies, in many, many places, the police will do 
absolutely nothing if you turn to them. But if you do, and they do give you help, to be completely ostracized from your community for turning to them in the first place, and to ruin your ability to get a job, to enjoy yourself, to be happy. Let's talk about the democratic amendment of the European Union. It's basically based on a deal. When you're offered membership, um, you get an agreement with which um, you know, can include various economic and social targets that these countries can choose to um, aim for in their own way and in their own time, right? And you think, like, that's a, like, a good thing that happens. The agreement generally comes to life when they all hold some basic human rights of some sort that they buy into, but it's mostly like an economic agreement. It's about like, trade and stuff. And we think that's very easy for these countries to agree to and very popular because it's basically of objective benefit to all of the parties involved. Well, what you're doing is changing the, the, the scope of this kind of agreement. And you're doing it in a, a, a very dangerous way because it comes so long after the initial agreement was made. These new requirements vastly expand the scope of what the EU thinks it can do it, and, and it creates create substantial change for that initial deal. Why is this so dangerous? Two things. Firstly, it, just, it um, damages the democratic mandate of um, the U European Union for the citizens of member states. Right? It increases distrust with the European Union. They no longer think they're confident what it is the European Union thinks it can or cannot do in your country. We think the result of that is increased pressure on countries in a context where we already have a vast rise of Euroscepticism and um, uh, far right groups to pressure the government to act against the European Union's interests and to demand like special treatment that undermines the kind of integration that you guys think is so good and that's necessary for organic change uh, of the type we're talking about on the ground. And secondly, it's damaging when you're talking about new member states, like potential member states. Because they're not going to trust the deal that they're offering. It makes it much less compelling um, a, a, an agreement for them. We think that's really bad because it undermines the ability to democratize, um, which we think is like a, a great good. And it also means they're going to turn to other protectors that are more aligned with their beliefs. People like Russia. Um, we think that's a bad thing uh, because it uh, creates like you know a, a protector that doesn't agree with the things we do and like stops the kind of integration that we need to get out of the country.